and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Creative Jam, the the developers and and releasers of the upcoming Powered by the Apocalypse game Nightbound, which we'll be talking about today. The one and only Federico Gilberto. How you doing today, man? I'm hoping I got it right that time. Hey, Mildra. Yeah, that, that was quite good. Thank you. I'm doing good. Thanks. Um, enjoying the weekend, uh, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, how, are you? how are you doing? I'm, do I'm doing all right. It's, I'd say I'd say nothing's going on on a Sunday, but that's kind of redundant. Nothing ever happens on a Sunday. Oh no, no, that's 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 why I like Sundays. I get to chill for yeah. a day. Well, until until football season comes around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if if you're wondering, am I talk am I talking about football or am I talking about American football? The answer is yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes, I, I know it's a shock to the system that somebody stateside would know <laughs> would know about would know about football, but uh, I do not limit myself to laughing at sports teams in my own in my own country. Oh, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good, yeah. Every every sport has that one has that one team or individual that is my whipping boy. Even in something <laughs> like F one, my whipping boy in that has been Ferrari for the longest time. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't, wa I haven't watched F1, mm -hmm. like, in ages. It used to be kind of stable, ritual, in my house every Sunday. To the limit that I was hating my uncle because he came in every time. Oh, let's change channel in the TV because there's the, the F1, there's Schumacher running. I'm like, mm, I don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. So, one of the traditions that I ha that I go through with every newcomer in the temple is... Going through the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, I guess it's not going to be a big surprise, but the, my first introduction was D&D 3.5, back when I was... A little bit older than 18 years old. Um, I, I knew. For shock. Oh, <laughs> of course. Um, I I knew I knew the game. Well, I knew the game because you know, if you're a little bit nerdy, you, you hear about this stuff. But I've never had a chance to play a role play game mm -hmm. up and up until that time. And then a group of friends. Uh, we met this, this. We made this new friends with my. Uh, today today wife at the time girlfriend um and uh yeah they were like let's try some D, D. have you ever played i was like yeah one always wanted to play but never had anyone that was interested in doing that um so yeah we played uh, 3.5 then <laughs> then after a while um got to try other games the one that made it stick was Vampire the Masquerade um, because apparently I have a dark soul. <laughs> hey, we're not, and, uh, and we're not dealing with a Miyazaki game. No, no, we're not dealing with a Miyazaki game. Although I'm trying, I'm trying to reach the DLC area of Elden Ring these days, but that's that's been a challenge. Anyway, sorry, I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess v Vampire was what made it made it stick to mm. be honest and then from there it was a we opened the floodgates we we then moved to ireland where we live right now mm -hmm. we've been living here since 2015 and uh we meet we we had this um um uh, established group of friends where we would we, we, we would play play every week try different games and everything mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I can, I can, cer I can certainly get that. Oh. Just, uh, just out of curiosity, do you remember 
what clan what clans you tend to gravitate to when when playing vampire well you you you, you see my discord avatar right because that, that's that's Toriador. oh so bruja <laughs> no Toriador. <laughs> don't disrespect me like that <laughs> uh, um funny well, story my first i i have a tattoo uh, dedicated to my first vampire character. Uh, of course, it was a Toridor. It's a skull with vampire teeth, dripping blood, and a rose stuck within within its mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't. It, that guy didn't end well. Yeah. We, end, we ended up in a block contract, and <laughs> he went up in flames because he talked too much. <laughs> well, I've always skewed towards Ventru, so. <laughs> Very well. All right. Yep, Clan Clan Ventru, owning the world Besties. so you don't have to. <laughs> Besties, then, because you know, a good Ventru is only good as as a story or companion. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Although some sometimes if I wanted to be a complete jackass, I'd I'd pick Malkavian. Oh yeah, that's funny. Oh, uh, and go through an entire campaign speaking Pig Latin. <laughs> Sounds about right. I mean, if I mean, given the whole milk, I had I had thought about doing doing a full on a full on language that was just randomizing all of the letters in the English language. Uh, but I I I stopped myself and going, why am I inventing a whole language just for a bit? Because the right I, question is, why not? Well, I I did it anyways, <laughs> just a little bit less elaborate. Because, because, on one hand, yeah, it's a bit exce it could be considered excessive to do all of that just for a bit, just for a gag. On the other hand, uh, I am so I am the same person who waited two years to get re to get revenge on a family prank. So, <laughs> it's the character then. <laughs> if that seems a bit petty, well, that's because it is. <laughs> No judging, oh. at all. Besides, haven't you ever heard the expression "revenge is a dish best served cold"? Of course, of course. Two thirds and... out of the year is nothing but cold over here. <laughs> 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 I can I can definitely see the vibe of a dark soul, given that given um, the central premise with Nightbound. But yep. before before I get into that, I do want to address the other half of the. Um, origin story. Nightbound is using Powered by the Apocalypse, so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask what your first introduction to Powered by the Apocalypse was. First introduction was Monster of the Week. And then from there we didn't stop. <laughs> because as, as, as we mentioned before with my uh, uh, group, we're like we always wanted to try the Powered by the Apocalypse, a uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game. Um, not everybody was necessarily welcoming the idea because, you know, preferences. Some people like more crunchier games. Some people like more uh, storytelling, story-driven and story-oriented games. But yeah, eventually we we tried with we tried Monster of the Week. Had so much fun with it. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went. I he, the next one was Sprawl, Urban Shadows, Apocalypse World. Eventually, we went to the. Uh, <clears throat> we, we 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 eventually went and played the actual. The every the the, the one that started everything, and uh, Masks is one of my favorite favorite as well. Masks a new generation. That's some something that I love. Mm. Now recently we started to play Monster Arts Second Edition. Uh, yeah, so, um, you, you you can you you can say that that's my favorite type of system. Yeah. Now, with I can I can certainly see it and it certainly has its merits. I've never I've never been one to say oh we should oh we should do crunch heavy or we should do crunch light and like. No, my my approach has has always been, 
okay, what are what do we want to do and what's the best fit for it? Uh -huh. <laughs> I use a tailor analogy for it. You now the way a tailor is going to be sizing you up to fi to figure out what the best um f the best fitting outfit for the occasion he that he can muster for you. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Yep. Obviously not every not every game is going to be for every body. Of course. Uh -oh. And and that's that that that's legit, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think the same applies to game design, right? When you have an idea and you're thinking about what system mm -hmm. fits this idea, right? Yeah. I think what people have what what I thought about when making Nightbound was right. What do I what what do I want to represent with this game? What what kind of what what are my goals with this? Yeah. And <clears throat> so every, every system it's good for what it does. I'd say, uh, not not all. I do not think that there's a perfect system that can do everything. D and D is good for, you know, dungeon crawling, combat, epic adventures, and everything. Um, Call of Tulu is good for investigative horror. Um, Stories. Paranoia is good for is good for making people rage quit. <laughs> yeah. Because you're not cleared for that, citizen. Are you unhappy with your clearance? <laughs> and um, you know, just just in the just in the same way that that's a if you want if you want to if you want to end a friendship, just have everyone play a set of Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> the one that does it for me is actually Risk. I ended friend friendships over games of Risk, to be honest. <laughs> oh, uh, that's the, fine. In the same vein, I've, I've I have camp I have lobbied to have games of Jenga be registered as torturing non-combatants in the Geneva Convention. <laughs> Look, if you've played if you ever played a late game of Jenga, you know exactly why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's in that spot where nobody even wants to breathe the wrong way, just in case. Just in case that might knock the whole thing over. Have you ever Have you ever played Dread? Yes. That's the best application for Jenga in a role play game. I think oh. that 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 game is brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. Unfor unfortunately, since I do a lot more virtual tabletop, I can't really play Dread using yeah, tabletop I know. simulator. The, the, in that way, because the phys the physics engines in, in that kind of game are going to be a little bit more janky. Yeah. But now, obviously, you within the first couple pages of the quick start for Nightbound, you mm -hmm. cited the Hellblazer comic, and in pr and especially citing John Constantine, even putting his um, his monologue from what from one of the books from one of Garth Ennis's runs. Um, yeah. In the in the for in the um, third page of the damn book. So, but yeah. what would some of the other major influences on Nightbound be outside of um, outside of Hellblazer? So outside of Hellblazer, what I what has influenced Nightbound was um, what most of the influence are, re revolve around. Uh, comic books because some of the playbooks came straight out of other comic books like the saint you can clearly see you, you can clearly translate that into preacher because one of the, the first moves that you have already unlocked is basically genesis you tell people what you, you command people what they what they what they have to do and you have to be careful with that otherwise uh doesn't end well um uh lucifer is another one um with uh the rebel that we unlocked with the kickstarter campaign um the setting comes from a mike carey not it doesn't necessarily come from that but the way it's represented in um, one of my care my carry book series the uh, felix caster series uh the way you know Supernatural and mundane are mixed together. There are ghosts all of a sudden, the zombies 
on the way. It's not that uh, explicit, although it might seem it is in Nightbound, but that, that the, the idea came from that. Uh, as well as the media, media right? Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, lo lots of ur urban fantasy, um, other urban fantasy um, uh, media yeah. out there. The way you describe it, it's, it sounds like a lot of a lot of it falls into to a category that I call modern mythos. Um, yeah. The, which is just a catch-all for a lot of those shows and books and whatnot that cropped up in the night in the nineties, that were depicting they were depicting these supernatural co um, coexisting but hidden within the modern world. I'd, if I had to say what the Patient Zero was, probably Lost Boys back in the late 80s. At least in terms of that concept. And I, I know that I know I have, on, I have on word of God that that was the big inspiration for Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah. Uh, which I can I can certainly see I can certainly see it. And Obviously, obviously, there's a lot more um, entries during the '90s and after it that fall into that category. You already, you mentioned Lucifer. That that certainly falls into it. Supernatural certainly falls into it, and they weren't made. And the versions that a lot of people are going to be familiar with certainly weren't made in the in the 1990s. But the oh, but old habits never really die. So, taking that taking that into account, uh, within with within the within powered by the apocalypse, obviously you have the standard two two d six setup. You have the primary um, traits, and you yeah. have the uh, play, you have the playbooks. Now, in the quick start, there were four there were four uh, major playbooks. And I'd like to go into them and kind of get a feel for their particular play style, how they'd interact with the world, if you don't mind. Yep, absolutely. Um, and actually, in the on the full Kickstarter, you can get several more that weren't in the quick start. So we go. I'll be going. I'll be using the Kickstarter page as my basis for this. Mm -hmm. So the first one would be the Damned. Yeah. Oh. The Damned. Is the one that sold his soul to, to the devil, basically, uh, as the name calls out, right? So the type, play style, and character I want to evoke with them. It's someone that, who's desperate to gain back his, his freedom, is to redeem his soul and get uh, free from the grasps of hell, right? So there's um, the background questions are what major, major, predominantly narrows down the, the character, right? So who you were before going before be uh, going to hell, right? Mm -hmm. um, what what have you done to earn your damnation? And what have you lost because of your demission? And how do you think you can fix that, right? So th those are the questions. Mm -hmm. um, the idea for this character is that he has a strong, he has done something that he regrets. All, all, of, all of the playbooks have done something that they regrets, but in this case, it's something that has caused his soul to go to hell. So that's a condition, right? So you are when, one, once this character dies, and that doesn't happen, or might not happen at all in the game, but uh, it can happen right at the end of this character arc. Mm -hmm. What we going, what what we need to find out is, okay, what have you done to not go to hell now? And 
there's this concept of um, the, the main mechanic of the game, apart from, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse mechanics, is the guilt mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. So every, char every character has but guilt, which gives them, reminds them of what they've done. It gives them a reason to push forward, right? So the main question that every character should ask, ask should, should answer is, will you be able to break the cycle of guilt? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you feel guilty, try to fix it. You do something wrong, feel guilty again, and the cycle repeats until, you know, you don't do mistakes anymore. Um, the Damned uh, is a can be a, phys a very physical character because they they have the ability to inflict a lot of harm and be um, be a sort of powerhouse from hell. Mm -hmm. The first move, demonic aspect, makes you change your body in a way that you can you get a plus pl a, a plus one ongoing but at the same time you can gain narrative advantage n narrative advantages over in the fiction say you want the ability to fly so you grow f you grow you grow wings you get the benefits from that you might get also the uh, negatives um those applies of course and also it plays as a tem as the mm, the kind of character that uh, tempts you, right? I I always Im imagined while while writing this playbook, I always imagined the um, uh, what's it called the movie with Ken Reeves, the Dev Devil's Advocate. Is that it? Is that what it's called in English? Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, I, 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 I just don't remember the um, the title in English. I, I remember it. I remember it in Italian, but anyway. Um, I'm get, I always apropos to bring that up, given that the pregen in the quick start is a lawyer. Exactly. <laughs> uh. Exactly. That's not. Um, that was done on purpose because that 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 was the main uh, character that I was imagining yeah. while doing this. Right. So mm -hmm. you. Um, you tempt others. You can. You know what others want. You can bind them with contracts. You can bind them with um, uh, promises. Because as Lucifer, that's more from the TV sh the TV show. Yeah. But let's not say that uh, <laughs> out loud. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know. Yeah. You you know what you know what others des you 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 can know what others des what are others desires. And you can use that to your advantage to make them do what you want. So, um, you, <clears throat> it's a very manipulative character, right? Mm. Um, supposed to be manipulative. You're supposed to exploit what hell has given you because these powers have come, come f straight from your dark, from your damned soul, right? And, um, so doing so might not be uh, the best way to redeem your soul, but still, uh, this is what this is the, 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 the cards that are being handed to you, so you might be might as well use them for the best of your intentions. Mm -hmm. So, I, th I think I'd like to pivot instead of um, instead of leaning into playstyle for the for for these kind of things. I like to mm -hmm. lean instead into the touchstones, the kind of characters in fiction that would be would be fit would be a good fit for the different playbooks that you've got. The second one to cover is the saint. Yeah, that preacher, basically. Mm -hmm. You had you were given powers, or you have powers because you firmly believe. In something, it doesn't have to be 
Christian god for sure. Of course, the imagery is that one. But if someone wants to lean into other religions, that's 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 totally fine. People can do that. Mm -hmm. um, you you have the word of God. You can tell people what you can command people to do your bidding. You can um, protect others with your light, with your um, with your holiness. You can you can use that to protect others, and you can cast demons back to hell. Does mm -hmm. the does this? Um, you can literally, <laughs> and I think that's one of the most over the top playbooks that. <laughs> I made for this game, uh, at least the one the one that I like the most because I just I, I I imagine the scenes that could play out that sounds silly yet yet very very enjoyable and uh, fun to play. I you can literally baptize someone that's evil, a demon, let's say, and you can send it back to and and you can make it ascend to it to to heaven, <laughs> get it out of the way. Which I think it's a cool scene. It's something cool to do that you could do. Um, but yeah, the main, the main, the main touchstone here would be Preacher, um, mm -hmm. um, the main character from Preacher, along with also <clears throat> some of the things that we could see that we see in the Constantine movie. You know, all the um, because that, that, that the, the movie really, really focused more on. The religious aspect of the character that uses religion to you know religious rights and everything so i i i thought of that as well while creating this this playbook yeah i could i could certainly see it uh, so next would be the occultist well that's john for sure uh constantine first mm -hmm. of all uh, the usual, the the the, 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 occult, the occultist would be the usual um, guy that studies occult, has um, tons of dusty books, and knows all the ins and outs of how the supernatural works. Um, they're very good at casting spells. They have a sanctum of their own that they can use for various different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, they can uh they can have a familiar they can that like, could talk <laughs> do stuff which i think it's fun um uh, yeah the, the the occultist is basically john constantine so one was very arrogant knows knows his shit all too well and doesn't um doesn't hide it doesn't make it a secret so yeah, if i if i wanted to make a deep cut i could also invoke um shadow man yeah yeah that could be that could be one as well sure that's a lot of people won't i feel bad that a lot of people only know shadow man through the game on the n64 I'd like I'd like to amend I'd like to amend that in the future. But next is the Slayer. Yeah, the Slayer is Buffy. Uh supernatural as well. You could put, you could you could see a little bit of that in, uh, in into it as well. Um, um, the the only difference that I would say that I would differentiate this from Buffy is that um the bre in the premises of the playbook you're not chosen to slay them but you choose yourself to do it because they've ruined your life basically oh, yeah. the regenerated character is the the one in the the one in the quick start it's very strong on that because your your family was slain by vampires mm -hmm. and you want to slaughter them all now because you well you're very wrathful say let's say uh you could you could see a little bit of blade into it as well mm -hmm. without that that could be that 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 also that's also something that um 
be considered a good fit for this for this playbook. Ah. Yeah, I could, I could, I could, I could certainly see, I could certainly see it if I really wanted, if I really wanted to, if I really wanted to stretch things. That I could, al I could also throw in Ash. But although, yeah, Ash doesn't have the same style of guilt. It's more of just being in the complete wrong place at the wrong time. Well, yeah, because the way it's depicted in the movie, but if we want to be a little bit philosophical, you could say that he has the guilt because he brought his friends to the cabin first time around, and now he feels... Like, I think the the guilt part, it's more shown in the TV series, the one they did on Netflix. Oh. That first, yeah. but that 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 that's my pers my personal opinion, of course. I, what, what do you know? <laughs> it was done. It was done a little bit further on with the with the comics, which mm. I think at one I think at one point crossed over with Marvel Zombies, which is um, very fitting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but next would be the medium. Medium. So the medium is your classic um, um, clairvoyant character that can see the future, can see the past, can talk to spirits, can go into the, um, uh, we call it the, uh, too many things at the same time. <laughs> they can they can travel through the astral plane. Plane. That's what I was looking for. Um, it, I personally didn't think too much of a touchstone for reference. Um, when I when I made this character, I was I was referencing one of the earliest. Um, um, chapters from Hellblazer, one of the first chapters from Hellblazer, mm. where to escape Nurgle, Constantine went into the astral plane, so I sat from there and he went all into a rapido for this character. But yeah, like the... Um, um, there was the True Calling TV series, you could probably relate to that as well, where, mm. you know, the character talks to the dead and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, as a as a tight tight relationship with spirits and dead people knows the future of people and how they end up, and that makes them guilty because no matter what they do to try to avoid it, most of the time it ends up how the, how is how they saw it or they they foreshadow it mm -hmm. in their their visions. Uh, yeah, I ended up writing I ended up writing a short story a long time ago about somebody who basically had. His family had to act as the Grim Reaper's bounty hunter. Okay. Um, bas basically, help basically helping the dead with with old um, issues that are keeping them tethered. Mm -hmm. And occasion and occasionally dealing with somebody trying to cheat death and um, introducing them to actual death. Okay. Oh. Um, but the last on the list is the victim. Yeah. <clears throat> so the victim is the um, the the only playbook that doesn't have a strong. Well, it has a strong supernatural background in the sense of what the, what it happened to them, right? But um, it's probably the only one that doesn't have moves that reflect the superpowers, right? So they cannot, they don't do flashy stuff compared to the others, but it's the one that has basically, um, uh, it's the underdog for this game. The one that doesn't have magical powers, even though all the characters uh, have access to magic through the basic moves, um, but it doesn't have any inherent supernatural background, apart from the fact that they were a victim of a supernatural assault or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly get that. So, 
with, now with that in mind, there you had already talked about the guilt about the guilt mechanic, and and how it's out and within the quick start you explain how it's built up through its own uh, clock. Yeah. Uh, what made what made you want to have this get this guilt system as a primary pillar of the of the design of Nightbound? So, I think the main reason is the kind of story I wanted to, the kind of scenes and situations I wanted to bring up with the game, right? So, since uh, Hellblazer is the main uh, source of inspiration for this game, and that the try and what I, what I, I try to do with Nightbound is to rep not replicate, but inspired play that's based on that um the kind of narrative the kind of themes um what i wanted to do is to have a mechanic that says okay you do stuff you mess it up and you feel better about it and the more you mess it up the more bad situations are gonna come your way and uh, when eventually you're gonna have to you know try and not mess up anymore um, so, the guild mechanic comes from that, and it's a uh, way to... The... Let me make an example, right, with, with El Brazer, because I think that's, um, that makes it more uh, easy to, to understand what, what, I want to, what I want to achieve with this, right? So, in El Blazer, the first, one of the first situations that we're introduced to is the um newcastle incident right so the old deal with astra so that's that's john, that's john constantine main mm -hmm. guilt the fact that he was too smug he played with fire a little bit too much and underestimated the situation to the point that a little girl ended up in hell and that was entirely his fault mm -hmm. and that's something that <clears throat> accompanies this character for a long time almost all the run uh, eventually gets superseded by other <laughs> guilt but that's that's because the, the old the, the old shenanigan is that uh, he has to do he has the power to do something about these creatures although he doesn't want to because he knows that when one he get once he gets involved he has to hurt someone he loves and if, but the choice is always do I hurt someone I love or do I let the world burn? Mm -hmm. And so it chooses to not let the world burn and hurt someone he loves, eventually feeling uh, guilty for doing that and feeling alone and everything. So that's the that's basically what I'm trying to to replicate with the guilt mechanic. Mm -hmm. And given that one part of that mechanic is bonds, which do have do have questions, but there, but um, it's still a very broad concept. Within mm -hmm. the full book, do you plan on putting a few examples here and there to help give people coming in an idea of how to flesh out how to flesh out bounds, so it's not just um, thro being thrown into the deep end. They're not just being thrown into the deep end and being told to swim. Um. <clears throat> so. Uh, you you're talking about bonds, right? Yes. Okay. So every playbook has specific bonds that you have to build, right? There are two. Uh, and then eventually, with the ba with the basic moves, you can create more of them. Of them, but that's fleshed out in the basic move itself. Let's say, let me pick uh, the occultist, for example. Um, so you have instructions, basically. I'm ask I'll ask you to I will, I will ask you to describe the bond based on a on a prompt on an input that I'm giving you with the playbook. You have to uh, you you need to create someone that um, is either your assistant with your magic experiment magical experiments or a guinea pig and um and because of your background you messed it up in a 
you mess it up with an experiment or with a ritual that you try to attempt and um, the byproduct of that is that you hurt someone and everything but you have an assistant and that's someone that's close to you and helps you the other one is someone that reminds you that, that reminds you who you were in the past before making that mistake so whole smug and and arrogant and they want to get into the occult as you wanted to at the time and you're trying to not making them commit the same mistake as you that you made but that's an example so there are in the in the final playbooks there are uh, prompts that help you build those bonds uh the, both starting bonds and then the the ones that create that get created into next uh during during actual play are more specific because they come out as a result of situations and consequences of actions mm. uh you could do that there's uh there's a um there's a basic move that's called sacrifice yourself to save to save someone mm -hmm. if <clears throat> that someone isn't a bond right because to you to use that with this with this basic move you roll plus the the bond strength every bond has a strength that goes from one to three okay the higher the higher this number, the stronger is the bond. And that that has implications with your guilt as well. We can go into that later. Mm -hmm. So you if you don't have a bond with that specific NPC that you're trying to save from arm, you roll plus zero basically. And if you're successful, they become one of your bonds. So you're bonded by that experience that you saved them and now they stick in they, they, they'll stick to you mm -hmm. yeah now with that with that in with that in mind oh the game the game is taking place in the setting that you that you called new eden yeah um, and give, given the fact that this is a place where they're going to be for a good amount of time uh, unless they're doing one of the uh, scenario add-ons that you have as part of the Kickstarter. Um, yep. With New Eden, do you have it um, as... So do you have it set up where you're, go where you're going to be... where there's going to be different districts, different areas, different themes in, diff yep. in parts of the city? Yeah. <clears throat> so, in the basic game, uh, I've... So New Eden wasn't part of the game up until six months ago, basically. It was more traditional power by the apocalypse world building where you had to come up with a place and everything with the setting yourself right from the bat. But from the play from from playtest I didn't like the result of that, it felt a little bit too loose, right? So I decided to take the mask mask or blades in the dark approach where they give you they give you a setting that it's not too strong, it's not too predominant in play. So you don't have to be very religious with what we give you in yeah. uh, uh, with Nightbound, right? It's yeah. just um, some tips and some hooks that you can use and give you the, 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 the feeling of the game, right? And mm -hmm. the, the, the bits and helping you setting up the mood. Yeah, but it's... yeah, in the, in the base game we give you some districts plus the ones that uh, right now there are uh, seven of them with uh, points of places of interest, some NPCs already built in. Uh, with the stretch goals, we have unlocked another four, I believe. I don't remember exactly how many. Um, there's another bunch of them that gonna be that gonna be included in the base game, and um, and on top of that, you can create you you. you I wouldn't. Uh, there's no specific mechanic to create new districts at the moment. I'm thinking about maybe that's something that I would like to add uh, on the side, a sort of hack new Eden mechanic. But um, I wouldn't exclude that if players players want, they could come up with their own dis districts that to add because 
um, the map is in full, basically. What you see on the book is not everything. Uh, there's still blank spots that you can fill with, uh, with your own imagination. And the, the interesting, the interesting thing that I've done with uh, with the setting is that um, I've given the moves to each district. Um, the moves act as a sort of flavor flavor setting, right? So te I'm, I'm telling you the setting without telling you the setting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying. <laughs> this is what this is what, what I was going for. Um, which I think they're interesting. They had, they add a little bit of uh, stakes, once and a little bit of flavor, one uh, to the scenes that that you're playing in those places, and and also to have to give playability to 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 to, to make the setting playable, as uh, sort of a tool rather than oh here's the setting, this is your backdrop, do whatever you want with it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. I've always been in favor of giving people the opportunity to make their own to make their own settings, but throwing them a bone so that so that they have something to build around. You know, instead instead of throwing them, as I said before, throwing them into the deep end of the water and telling them swim, damn it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's basically what the what New Eden wants to do, right? It's just mm -hmm. giving you a hook to start, yeah. and then if you want to add all your ideas. Feel free to do it. Um, if you don't want to use it and you want to create, you want to create your own setting, then do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. But now, with with that in with that in mind, I did see I did of course see that you have a set of um, add-ons that you're that you're putting in that are. As I understand it, taking the Nightbound concept and putting them in different types of um, th types of themed settings, like yeah, Nightbound by Gaslight is obviously doing doing Victorian London, and yeah. probably has at least one Jack the Ripper reference. In fact, yeah. I see, in fact, I see one right on the cover. <laughs> yeah, yep. um, indeed. Route six Route six 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 is more of the is is more of the um, highway story kind of kind of horror. Um, yeah. The the kind of the kind of thing you'd see in the in the more desert regions of the of um the of the southwest. Um, yeah. Southwestern United States. Um, Sengoku no Nightbound is doing um fe is doing feudal Japan. Yeah. Um, and. Nightbound 1943, I believe, is doing world. I believe is doing World War Two. Although, I don't know. I might try and mess around with with 1943 to do World War One because we want to talk about horror as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea is to touch upon uh, what what World War Two setting mm. with 1943. Um, that's what that that one is still in development, so I don't still don't know all the ins and outs. Oh. Um, it would be, but, uh, it would yeah. be very easy to j to just crib notes from Hellboy, or um, crib notes from the better Wolfenstein games. Yeah, yeah, that's basically the idea where I started with. I thought about Hellboy when came up with that idea for an add-on, and yeah, so basically a distorted version of history. Yeah, and I do, um, I do, th even if it's going a bit man in the high castle, I do think. Wolfenstein, the the old blood and the new and the new order are good are good examples of what to lean into. Yeah, um, definitely. The new Colossus, no, <laughs> no, nobody likes the new Colossus. <laughs> um, and of of course, of course, um, I'm ge I'm guessing that with each of each of those add-ons, they're going to have their own. Um, I won't say their own playbooks, but their own ways to spin the existing playbooks, so that so that it fits the theme. <clears throat> so, um, there's there's gonna be guidelines for sure on how to fit playbooks. Although the playbooks are pretty open at the moment, in the sense that there's no specific references to. Um, 
um, modern day culture or anything in those so you could prob you, you you can basically apply them to any kind of uh um to any kind of era or um time imaginarium right so um the playbooks should be able to fit into all of the scenarios but um still debating with the team whether we should do some sort of thematic spins to the playbooks that's that's still an option for sure what what all the add-ons are gonna have are their own moves for the play that are, that are thematic to the place um probably some additional ba base moves as well um depending how cumbersome it is because um considering the playbooks the base moves see the moves there's a lot of moves <laughs> and it might get too confusing, so I don't want to make it too heavy. To, to, I don't want to have too many things to remember as well. Mm -hmm. I could, I could certain, I could certainly see some, I could certainly see some um, needing that approach, because, um, like, I'll, I'll use Sengoku no Nightbound for an example of this. You know, that's dealing with feudal Japan and mixing the the. Um, mythologies of that of that area in that time period yep. and think things like the things like the deals with the devil and the like well that that can happen but the but the concept of demon isn't exactly this isn't exactly the same and yeah as a as a lifelong weave this is some this is something of a pet peeve that i've had with a lot of a lot of archetypes that got translated as demon ha are more fey than anything else, uh, because mm -hmm. they're usually translating words like ayakashi or, more often yokai or um, yoma, especially back in the '90s. And those aren't really demons in the traditional sense; they're the equ the equivalent of um, of the the kind of creatures that would beat that would be more fey in nature, more strange in nature, that kind of thing. I'm vastly simplifying, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I get your point, of course, yeah. No, and that, that's, that's, that's a valid call-out, uh, and for sure we're gonna have to, to make the kind of argument once we get to the end stages of making that settings. Um, uh, we... Um... The, the mechanic, the, me the mechanics, the playbooks have to make sense with what you're going to play for sure. It does, well, otherwise it doesn't work, right? It feels kind of disjointed, in a way. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that every that each of these scenario books needs a whole host of playbooks, uh, but some, but some, some might need means to reskin some of the existing ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, to dub because each of even even though each of them isn't doing a setting, it is doing a theme, a different type of the, of that modern mythos. Well, yeah. not exactly modern in the case of two, in the case of three of them, but you get my point. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh -huh. But with that, now with that said, what would you, I? I do want I do want to offer my congrats on how well the thing's doing because you you guys have a week to go and you're at um, just sh just three hundred shy of nine thousand euro, and you were only asking for a thousand. Oh. Thank you. And what would you guys be shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Page count. <clears throat> Uh, I would say a little bit more than 250, more or less. Yeah, it's, more I'd or say less. that makes sense. More or less, yeah. yeah, because at the moment, the manuscript alone in the state that it is without graphics, art, and everything is a little bit more than 90 pages in A4 format. So the book is going to be in A5. So a little bit, you can imagine double this number plus all the all the arts, all the playbooks, and everything put into that. 
Uh, it's probably gonna be uh, a little bit more than 250. Oh yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And what would you now with that in mind? Um, what would you be shooting as far as a re, for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a um, a rough a rough ballpark in a sense. <clears throat> Rough ballpark, um, all considering the state of works where we are right now, we estimating November, no, this November to be able to send mm -hmm. out the, the, the all all the all the material. Provided, if digital material is ready before, we're probably gonna be sending that before November. But the estimated delivery for uh, his, the physical edition is going to be November. Uh, that, that's what we're aiming for. All right, I can certainly get that. And with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Thank you so much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>